Face here back with another reaction video. This time I am reacting to Rise and Fall of the Majapahit Empire, Golden Age of Indonesia by Kings and Generals. Now, like uh, probably most Westerners, I have no idea about the history of uh, Indonesia. So this will be another new. This will be a new one for me because I literally know next to pretty much nothing. I've only heard Majapahit um, mentioned in uh, I think it was History of the World, I guess, by Bill Wirtz, which is another great video. If you haven't seen it, go check that out. Bill Wirtz, History of the World, I guess. So this is one I've been meaning to react to for for. A little while and I I just got sidetracked so I apologize even though people probably weren't expect me to react to this so um so the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction it is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand and if I do know anything I'll most likely pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which hopefully will be answered in the comments and I don't know why I just struggle to get comfortable then or oh, it feels like and uh, yeah so uh, apart from that the link to the original video will be in the description down below please go and subscribe to Kings and Generals another great history channel here on YouTube and it's still one of the top history channels here on YouTube among a fair few but that's just my opinion so um right so better not ramble on too much longer so let's get this up on screen subtitles are on alright let's get into this the Republic of Indonesia mm. is the most globally influential nation that the average Westerner knows almost nothing about. Pretty much. Home to over 275 million people, wow. it is the fourth most highly populated country in mm. the world and the largest majority Muslim country on the planet. Okay. Indonesia's territory extends over 17,000 mm. islands, spread out over 5,000 yeah. kilometers of ocean, upon which live... Yeah, because you... um. You hear about like Papua New Guinea, Brunei, Malaysia, and all the other Asian nations, but to most Westerners, pretty much know know next to nothing about the history of Indonesia, like the narrator just said at the beginning. It's one of the most influential nations that the average Westerner doesn't really know pretty much anything about. So, uh over 300 distinct ethnic groups among whom six different wow. religions are worshipped that hang on hang on jesus why can't i just time that right distinct ethnic groups yeah. among whom six hang on let me just islam protest protest protestantism roman catholic hinduism buddhism confucianism which that that's basically a kind of stoic it's like stoicism for those six who different know. religions are worshipped mm. that the modern indonesian republic has managed yeah. to unify such a huge and diverse mm. territory into a coherent nation state yeah. is nothing short of astounding which makes it okay. all the more incredible that this is not the first time in history it mm. has happened indeed today we will not be discussing the modern nation of indonesia Instead, we will explore the origins, culture, and history of a medieval Thessalocracy mm -hmm. that, in many ways, lays the groundwork for what Indonesia is today. Hang on. Hang on, let me just... Give me a sec. Okay, Google. What is a Thalassocracy? Thalassocracy or Thalatocracy, sometimes also Maritime Empire, is a state with primarily maritime realms, an empire at sea, or a seaborne empire. 
Traditional thalassocracies mm -hmm. seldom dominate interiors, even in their home territories. There you go. For those who don't know, thank you, Google. Democracy. That, in many ways, lays the groundwork for what Indonesia is. <coughs> Join us as we go back to a time before the ascendancy of Islam in the Nusantara archipelago and dive into the story of the Majapahit, a Hindu-Buddhist empire that mastered the ocean. There's one thing okay. that even becoming master of all the spices of the East won't help you with, hair wow. loss. So let's mention something instead that does help. Our sponsor for this video, Keeps. Two in three men lose hair to male pattern baldness slash kings and generals or click Feel the link free to in the check description. That out if you're That's keeps.com -E slash kings and generals. While the Majapahit was the largest and wealthiest empire to arise in Indonesia's pre-modern past, the building blocks of its vibrant culture, political policies, and immense economic prosperity all have their roots in the earlier history and natural geography of the island it was born on, the island of Java. From ancient times to the present day, Java has served as the beating heart of the vast Nusantara archipelago, and was the home island of most of Indonesia's most prominent historical states. Today, Java is the most highly populated island in the world, boasting a staggering population of over 150 million, which amounts to about three England's worth of people. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Java's huge... I mean, the whole... I think the whole of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the whole of the UK, is what, 65 million? Just a, even just a smidge higher? I, I'll have to... Hang on. Okay, Google. What is the current population estimated for the UK? According to Office for National Statistics, Population of UK at mid-2022. We estimate the UK population at mid-2022 is 67.6 million. So basically, just a smidge under 70 million. Yes, I do mean 7-0, for those who didn't hear that properly. ...population is descended from ancient sailors, who, around 3,500 years ago, crested upon Java's lush shores aboard sturdy catamarans and outrigger canoes. These Sorry, voyagers were the Austronesians, the greatest seafarers ever to live. Their dispersal around the islands of Southeast Asia was just one stop in a multi-millennia ocean-bound migration that began in Taiwan around 5,000 years ago and ended on the islands of Rapa Nui and New Zealand around 800 years ago. The Austronesian seafarers who made Java the final step in their ocean odyssey would quickly master the lands and seas of their new home, and their descendants would build some of the wealthiest and most culturally sophisticated states in all of history. The reason why Java is so populous in the modern day, and was so disproportionately prominent throughout history, is because its climate and location make it the single most bountiful island on Earth. Over 18 active volcanoes dot Java's jungle's landscape, spewing a steady stream of volcanic ash that, when settled into the soil, creates the most agriculturally productive land on the planet. On top of being an agrarian paradise, Java is the gateway to the Malacca Strait, a central nexus of a maritime silk road that since antiquity has connected China to the ancient civilizations of India, Persia, Arabia and beyond. The long-distance trade that flowed through this strait was facilitated by seasonal monsoon winds that made the journey both speedy and predictable for sail-powered ships. The main exports that Java contributed to the Maritime Silk Road were priceless spices like cloves, nutmeg, mm. pepper and mace, grown on the so-called Spice Islands of Maluku to the east, okay. but typically distributed by the rulers of Java. Mm. As early as the 1st century AD, Precious Indonesian spices were traveling as far afield as the Roman Empire. Mm. Overall, with access to the world's most productive farmland and valuable spices, and situated right at the bottleneck of the world's most lucrative okay. trade route, it is no wonder that the kingdoms of Java were able to achieve a level of power and prestige that many of their <coughs> contemporaries could only dream of. Mm -hmm. As the monsoon winds blew foreign traders onto Javanese shores, so too did they blow in foreign philosophies, sciences, okay. political principles, and religions. 
While the Austronesians were originally an animist people, constant contact with the civilizations of India saw them slowly adopt Hinduism and Buddhism as their two main faiths. By the 8th century AD, Javanese rulers had begun to portray themselves as avatars of Hindu gods, like Vishnu and Shiva, and style themselves as Devaraja, an ancient Sanskrit word meaning God-King. Grand monuments were consecrated to glorify their divinely mandated reigns, such as Barabadur, which to this day remains the largest Buddhist structure in the world, and Prambanan, the second largest Hindu temple in Southeast Asia. Despite this, neither Hinduism nor Buddhism fully displaced the pre-existing animist beliefs of the Austronesian peoples. In Java, new religions did not necessitate the abandoning of existing beliefs, but instead added more strands to an ever-richer woven fabric of connections to the supernatural world. If India was the place from which the kings of Java received their spiritual legitimacy, then China was the place from where they received their political legitimacy. Throughout most of history, China was the sun around which all of Asia orbited, and even faraway Java felt the Middle Kingdom's glow. Okay. It was an ancient custom that foreign kingdoms wishing to do commerce with China had to swear nominal fealty to the Chinese emperor, mm. something the rulers of Java played along with in order to gain access to Chinese riches. Throughout the medieval era, the political ties between China and Java ran deep and successful okay. rulers in Java often underlined their entitlement to rule by demonstrating China's approval. Or, in mm. the case of today's titular Javanese Empire, by successfully repudiating China's overlordship. Indeed, the story of the Majapahit's rise to power begins with the Emperor of the Yuan Dynasty, known better perhaps as the Great Khan of Khans. In the late 1280s oh, AD, Kublai. Kublai Khan, grandson of Chinggis, ruled over China as the Emperor of the Yuan mm. Dynasty. As master of the Dragon Throne, Kublai was not just a Mongol Khan, but had wow. inherited the political role of the Chinese emperors of old. Mm. Consequently, Kublai expected submission from all of the Celestial Kingdom's traditional tributary vassals, including those in Java. By the 13th century, the most powerful state on Java was the Kingdom of Singhasari. Under the rule of the mighty Buddhist warrior king Katanagara, Singhasari's coastal borders had expanded rapidly throughout the 1200s, monopolizing control over the crucial waterways of the Malacca Strait. The Great Khan looked upon Singhasari's growing chokehold over trade with concern, worried that the Javanese kingdom might grow so bold as to renounce Java's traditional status as tributary vassals of China, Kublai decided to remind King Katanagara of his place demanding he increase his yearly tribute to the Dragon Throne and send hostages from his royal family to the Yuan court. Not only did Katanagara refuse to obey the Khan's orders, he mutilated the Mongol envoys who had been sent to convey them. Naturally, the Great Yuan had only one response to this great insult, and a primarily Chinese punitive expedition of 1,000 ships and 20,000 men was assembled to sail south to bring the indolent Katanagara to heel. However, when this fleet arrived off the coast of Java three years later, in 1293, they were met with the rather anticlimactic news that King Katanagara was already dead, oh, wow. overthrown and slain by his treacherous vassal Jayakatwang, the Prince of Kadiri. Hmm. However, this usurper's power was far from secure. Raden Wijaya, the son-in-law of the late Katanagara, had organized a counter-revolution from his base of power in East Java, a stronghold called Majapahit. Rajan Wijaya ah, approached their Chinese leaders and promised that if they helped him defeat Jaya Katwang, he would gladly submit before the great Khan of Khans and pay a hefty yearly tribute to the Yuan court. Seeing this as an opportunity to place an obedient vassal on the Javanese throne, the Yuan generals ultimately accepted this offer. Joining together, the combined forces of Majapahit and Yuan crushed Jaya Katwang in battle. However, barely had the Yuan forces had time to revel in their triumph did Radin Wijaya turn on his allies, priming wow. his warriors to take to the hills and jungles to put up an asymmetrical resistance against the Chinese interlopers? Having already suffered manpower losses from their fight with Jaya Ketwang, and being mm. stuck deep in an unfamiliar country, the yeah. one commanders understood that a prolonged guerrilla war against their traitorous former ally would destroy them. Moreover, the monsoon winds would soon end leaving mm. them stranded for another six months if they did not leave soon. Weighing their options, the Yuan expedition made the wise decision to abandon mm. Java and sail home. 
A sly schemer and veritable Littlefinger, Radon Wijaya wow. had played friends and enemies alike to come out on top. After the Yuan fleet's departure, Radon Wijaya... I wonder if this is where the... Insp it does beg the question, is this the inspiration from Littlefinger from Game of Thrones? ...crowned himself the king of the newly established Majapahit state. Mm. A state that would, in the generations to come, expand further than any Javanese kingdom ever had. With that said, the Majapahit Empire got off to a precarious sophomore reign. After Radin Wijaya's death in 1309, the throne was inherited by his son Jayanagera. In traditional Javanese accounts, Jayanagera is ubiquitously maligned as a cruel and lecherous king who spent his days cuckolding his most important vassals. As such, his reign was mired with constant rebellions and came to an ignominious end in 1328 when he was assassinated by his surgeon on the operating table. Since Jainagera had no children upon his death, the throne passed to his sister, Diagataja. This queen proved far more capable than her brother and managed to stabilize the Majapahit realm. She did not accomplish this alone, relying heavily on her prime minister, Gajamada. Known as the Elephant General, Gajamada is perhaps the single most successful military commander in Indonesian history. What Belisarius was to the Byzantine Empire, mm -hmm. Gajamada was to the Majapahit realm. Ah. Upon his appointment to office in 30... Interesting comparison that Gajamada is just as... Uh just as good as a commander as Belisarius, which if you haven't seen my reaction to Epic History, was it? Yeah, Epic History's uh, series on Belisarius, I check, please check that out as well. 1836, Gajamada swore the famous Palapa Oath, in which he declared he would not taste spice until all the outer islands of the Nusantara archipelago were under Majapahit rule. Oh, wow. Gajamada proved true to his word, mm. and his conquests began when he led a Majapahit fleet to seize Bali in 1343. However, it wasn't until Queen Diagataja abdicated the throne in favor of her son, Hayam Wuruk, that mm. Gajamada really hit his stride. For the okay. better part of the next decade, his vast fleets expanded Majapahit's influence tenfold, bringing countless states across the entirety of the Nusantara archipelago under Majapahit overlordship. Okay. By the time the invincible elephant general died in 1364, the Majapahit Empire had reached its territorial zenith, having evolved into a seaborne power that exerted control over dozens of vassal mm -hmm. kingdoms containing hundreds of ethnic groups over thousands of islands, across 5,000 kilometers of ocean. It was one of the largest empires in the world at the time, and the largest empire in the history of pre-colonial Southeast Asia. However, it should be noted that the Majapahit Empire was not a centralized one. Only the islands of Java and Bali were controlled mm. by officials directly appointed by the king, mm. with the outlying territories consisting of client states, ruled by vassal kings with high levels of internal autonomy. At its height, the Majapahit was the master of the rice terraces of Java, the shipping lanes <coughs> of Malaku, and the spice islands of Malaku, mm. making it an agricultural cornucopia, a thassalocratic mm. juggernaut, and a serious contender for the richest empire in the world. The Majapahit's tendrils of commerce extended across the ocean, maintaining trade links with the South Indian Vijayanagara Empire and myriad nations across maritime Southeast Asia, such as mm. Champa, Daiviet, the Ayutthaya Empire, and the Khmer Empire. Even China was back in the system, with Sino-Javanese relations returning to a relatively stable okay. tributary status quo after the Han Chinese threw off the Mongol Yuan emperors and established the native Ming dynasty. Of course, no empire can rely on economic power alone. Yeah. To that end, the Majapahit was possessed of a mighty navy. Its main warship was the sleek yet sturdy Zhong, an ocean-going transport vessel okay. that could easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any ship from Europe's Age of Exploration. Wow. The Majapahit were said to be capable of assembling a fleet of up to 400 Jongs, alongside innumerable thousands of smaller vessels. On top of this, the Majapahit were one of the few nations in the medieval world rich enough to field a full-time standing army. Mm -hmm. This force of professional troops numbered 30,000 strong, comprising foot soldiers, charioteers and elephant riders. With contributions from their vassals across the Indonesian archipelago, the Majapahit could assemble up to 200,000 soldiers oh, wow. during a time when armies in Europe barely numbered above mm. the low thousands. 
After gunpowder technology was introduced to Java during the Mongol invasion of 1293, the Majapahit proved to be quick adapters and soon became Southeast Asia. Well, just that, like the Mongols were also uh, quick adapters when they, uh, they, they learned about some of the technological advances of the Chinese at the time. When they first uh, uh, invaded, when the Mongols first invaded China, they adapted to the what they called the black powder technology that was used at the time. Asia's premier pioneers of firearm warfare. Mm. Perhaps the most iconic Javanese weapon is the Chetbang, a type of bronze hand cannon employed by the invincible Gajamada during his conquests of the outer islands. During the golden reign of Hayam Wuruk, the extravagance of the Majapahit royal court <coughs> knew no bounds. Even the king himself was said to participate in the dazzling performances of the age, taking to the stage in a golden mask to perform topang, a form of ritual dance known to take years to master. Per the Devaraja tradition, the rulers of Majapahit derived their right to rule by virtue of being the incarnations of God on Earth, occupying a place in their kingdom that reflected the Divine's place in the cosmos. Radhan Wijaya, founder of the Majapahit dynasty, was posthumously depicted by his descendants as Harihara, an amalgamation of the deities Shiva and Vishnu. Throughout its golden years, the Majapahit realm was a global center of culture and learning. Its capital of Trowulan was a thriving cosmopolitan entrepot with traders and dignitaries from China, Bengal, Gujarat, Persia and beyond, all rubbing shoulders on its gilded streets. Even adventurers from faraway Europe, like the Franciscan friar Odoric of Podenoni, sprinkled the Majapahit domain with an extra dash of diversity. Religious life was vibrant, with Buddhism and Hinduism existing in full harmony with each other, both leaving their physical mark on the land. The Majapahits resided over a renaissance of religious architecture not seen since the days of Prambanan and Barabadur three centuries earlier, presiding over the construction of grand Hindu and Buddhist temples, known as Chandi, many of which, like the Grand Chandi Panataran, still enrich the Javanese landscape to this day. No empire lasts forever, and when the time for the Majapahit's decline inevitably came, it came in the form of Melodious Muezzin, proclaiming the call of prayer from the peaks of minarets. Much like Hinduism and Buddhism before it, Islam did not arrive in maritime Southeast Asia at the spear tip of a conquering army, but spread organically along the monsoon trade winds, okay. introduced by merchants from Arabia, Persia, India and Muslim communities in China. Muslim traders had been present in the Nusantara archipelago for centuries, but it was only in the 14th century that their religion gained a substantial following among the local population. As Islam grew in prominence, it corroded the authority of the Majapahit kings, for their spiritual authority relied on being seen as the living incarnation of Hindu and Buddhist gods, an idea summarily rejected by the tenets of the Muslim faith, which asserted that no mortal man can be a god, and there is no god but the one god. In the year 1389, King Hayam Wuruk passed away after an impressive 49-year-long reign. Seeing the king's death as an opportunity, Paramiswara, the Hindu Raja of a client city called Singapura, repudiated his vassalage to the Majapahit throne. In response, Majapahit forces invaded Paramiswara's lands and drove him from his city. Forced into exile, Paramiswara fled north to the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. There, according to traditional accounts, he converted to Islam, took on the Persian name of Sri Iskandar Shah, and established the Sultanate of Malacca. This fledgling Sultanate found its footing with the help of Zheng He, the most venerated sailor in Chinese history. Between 1405 and 1433, the great eunuch admiral embarked upon seven journeys across the sea, at the head of a fleet of massive treasure ships, all of which passed through Java and the Malacca Strait. In 1411, Prince Paramiswara supplicated himself before the Grand Admiral and joined him on the return journey to China to pay homage to the Yongle Emperor in Beijing. As it had been since ancient times, political relations with China were crucial in the balance of power in Southeast Asia. Throughout the early 15th century, Chinese protection allowed the Malacca Sultanate to flourish, while the Majapahit entered into a period of slow decline. Back in 1405, a succession crisis in the Majapahit royal court had led to a civil war that severely damaged the empire's grip on their overseas vassals. 
In the decades that followed, client rulers across Sumatra, Borneo and the Eastern Islands successfully broke away from Majapahit overlordship, all while the Malacca Sultanate quickly outpaced the Majapahit Empire as the primary trading hub in the region, while actively encouraging the spread of Islam throughout the region, which further eroded the power of the Hindu Buddhist monarchy. However, it was not the Malacca Sultanate that brought about the final demise of the Majapahit. The Grand Admiral Zheng He was a devout Muslim, and throughout his seven journeys, actively helped establish communities of Chinese, Arab and Malay Muslims on the northern coast of Java. By 1475, these Muslim communities had coalesced into the first Muslim state in Java, the Sultanate of Damak. By 1527, this Islamic Sultanate overran the enfeebled remnants of the Majapahit realm, forcing the last of its Hindu Buddhist rulers to flee to Bali, and putting out the final embers of an empire that had once dominated the entirety of maritime Southeast Asia. Although the Majapahit realm has long since been consigned to the graveyard of dead empires, its spirit still lives on in the hearts of the modern Indonesian people. In the 21st century, the Majapahit era looms large in Indonesia's history books, occupying a similar mm. place in the national narrative as the Achaemenid Empire does in Iranian history or the Roman Empire does in Italian history. Moreover, the historical conquests of the Majapahit are considered mm. to have set the precedent for the modern borders of the Republic of Indonesia. As the last holdout of native Hinduism in the Nusantara archipelago, mm. the island of Bali styles itself as the wow. cultural inheritor of the Majapahit legacy. However, even in the empire's home island of Java, which today is overwhelmingly Muslim, the locals still labor to preserve the cultural legacy of their Hindu-Buddhist ancestors. Today, the national motto of the Republic of Indonesia is Bineka Tunggalika, Unity in Diversity. Okay. Thus, it is easy to see why the modern Indonesian people cherish their Majapahit past, seeing the religiously tolerant, culturally diverse trading empire of old as a legacy to emulate, mm. as Indonesia embraces its identity as a modern multicultural nation and its role as an economic leader on the world stage. More videos on Indonesian history are on the way. To ensure you don't miss them, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing it. Whoops. Sorry. Didn't mean to press that. Stop it. Sorry. I meant to go out of full screen and, uh... Sorry about that. I was trying to get out of full screen and I accidentally clicked onto the next... next video. And, uh... So, that'll do it. This is, uh... This has been my first, uh, this is my, uh, at least now I got some, now I learned something about, um, about Indonesian history, so, so feel free to check out Kings and Generals channel for more about Indonesian history, so if you like my reaction to this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.